Greetings everyone, this is Ahav Ever from the Chronicles of Ahav Ever. And today's video is going to be how Torah Moshe Jews and Hebrew Israelites are not the same. So obviously the question that some people could ask, but I think most people won't, is what do I mean when I state that? Because I've said it in several videos. So essentially what I've said before is that Torah Moshe Jews have their own distinct uh, titles, um, texts, concepts, languages, needs, actions, claims, nationalities, etc. And by like token, Hebrew Israelites have their own distinct titles, texts, concepts, languages, needs, actions, claims, nationalities, etc. Now, again, as I stated in previous videos, this doesn't seem to be enough for some people. So I think I'll describe it or at least uh, uh, help people understand it in a little bit different way this time. As I've said before, essentially, when you have people who have uh, two different concepts, you know, or you know, if you have different ways of understanding things and different cultures they come from, you obviously can't say that they're the same people, you know. So essentially, you know, I don't see what the big problem is uh, with basically being able to say that Hebrews are lights on one side of uh, things and Torah Moshe Jews on the other side of things, and the two sides don't meet in the past, present, you know, and maybe even in the future, you know. So I think that there's a way I can look at it um, to kind of explain it better in, in this video and uh, also to kind of add to the previous videos I've done on it. So one question that could come up is how exactly does all this start? Well, for me, it started, I think, around the time that I did two videos about Jewish migrations into West Africa. Now, I want to point out that the videos were called Jewish migrations into West Africa. They had nothing to do with Hebrew Israelites. Um, you know, they had nothing to do with Hebrew Israelite history. Uh, or any history where anyone in the historical text or concepts I was talking about called themselves Hebrew Israelites. And that's a very important point. Um, you know, essentially I dealt with everything where people were being, you know, calling themselves Jews and, you know, were being called Jews by outside people. But, you know, nothing in the videos dealt with a history that someone could point to and say, ah, this history here, it came from the Hebrew Israelites and the people called themselves Hebrew Israelites. So because of all the comments I got from various people who defined themselves as Hebrew Israelites, I had to do two videos. One where a couple of Hebrew Israelites asked me questions, and in the video the point was just to simply answer the questions they asked about from a, a Torah Moshe Jewish perspective. The second video was another kind of, uh, you know, I guess you could say questions about uh, the difference between the texts used by Hebrew Israelites, and not just texts used by them, but also texts that come from them versus texts that come from Torah Moshe Jews. So it's important to note, you know, when dealing with this, and I always try to do this with videos, what do the Hebrew Israelites say, you know, concerning not just my videos, but themselves and also about people who are not Hebrew Israelites? Now, when it comes to trying to understand exactly what the, um, you know, the various views of various Hebrew Israelites are, I've gotten like a wide range of comments uh, concerning what exactly their linguistic, cultural, and textual uh, realities are, or, you know, what found within their communities. Um, and, and for me, it's been very hard to understand exactly um, how all of these different comments represent the Hebrew Israelite concept, um, especially with how differing they are. Um, and I've gone through this in previous videos, where, you know, where basically they're telling me that the language I use is Yiddish to them, um, which, again, to me tells me that they obviously have a linguistic difference if what they're seeing is Yiddish to them, and what they have is something completely different, which they call Hebrew in their form. Um, you know, I've also had people say very specific things, like this person said, Kikongo is Hebrew, not Yiddish, which, okay, if that's the Hebrew Israelite thing, that's fine. Um, but it seems to be at odds with other Hebrew Israelites. You know, maybe there's differences between, for example, Israelites, Hebrew Israelites who are Moors versus Hebrew Israelites who are not Moors. Um, maybe it's a regional thing. You know, I don't know. Um, but what I do know is that um, they seem to be very clear, and these seem to be experts in Hebrew Israelite culture, they seem to be very clear that they have a very different um, linguistic and cultural and text um, than what's found amongst Torah Moshe Jews. So it's at this point that I would like to go through and show what these differences are. And I'll start with showing exactly what, when I talk about texts produced by Torah Moshe Jews, what they are. So these texts here, you know, are considered to be Torah Moshe Jewish texts. There's nothing in the text, there's nothing in the authorship of the text of anyone who calls themselves or claims to be, uh, you know, going by the word or the statement Hebrew Israelite, meaning that if you were to look up the people who actually wrote these, they described themselves as being Jewish, you know. So, 
specifically, you know, we can say, you know, and again, you know, I know with Hebrew is like the Dead Sea Scroll part of it, you can debate about, but this particular Dead Sea Scroll is actually written in the script that's used by the Jews, and it seems to be the opposite of the script that Hebrew Israelites claim as their script. So from what I understand, this particular Dead Sea Scroll was at the top left would be Yiddish, according to the previous um, commenters who were Hebrew Israelites. But in any case, what I'm basically saying is these texts here are considered to be either Torah Mashe or the last one on the bottom left is Samaritan. So essentially, when we talk about Torah Mashe Jews and even Samaritans, these are the texts that we will be talking about. So again, you know, when we go through, we should be able to identify exactly what texts come from where and who wrote them. So for example, these texts came from Yemen. There's nobody in Yemen who ever used the term Hebrew Israelite. Um, and Hebrew Israelites themselves don't claim Yemenite Jews to be Hebrew Israelites. So we can pretty clearly state that there are some differences in the text because of the fact that these are not texts used by Hebrew Israelites and they weren't produced by Hebrew Israelites. And even if we were to say that, hey, there's a group of Hebrew Israelites who use these texts, we know that they didn't produce them. We know that they got them, you know, and purchased them like any other Jew and used them for themselves, but they were not things that were natural to their communities. Um, you know, so again, you know, there might be some Hebrew Israelites out there somewhere using the Talmud, but the Talmud itself never uses the statement Hebrew Israelite, and no one in the Talmud claimed to be a Hebrew Israelite, and there are a lot of Hebrew Israelites who claim the Talmud is not from them. So, same thing, you know, with any text from the Rambam. The Rambam never claimed to be a Hebrew Israelite and didn't identify himself as any, any anything like that. And didn't come from the regions that the Hebrew Israelites claimed to come from. You know, the same thing for the, you know, Rabsa Degon, you know, for the Ramban, you know, for any, you know, authoritative Jewish text that's considered to be authoritative by Hebrews, I mean, by Torah Mashe Jews. These are not texts that you find that any of the authors called themselves Hebrew Israelites. And in fact, the Hebrew Israelites themselves don't claim these people to be from their community. So then when we get into trying to identify, you know, exactly what a Torah Mashe Jew or Israeli is, um, you know, I've, we've covered this in the previous video also. You know, in terms of leaders of Torah Mashe Jewish communities, these are the people you find, whether it be from the Mizrahi um, Jewish communities, the Temani Jewish communities, the Sephardi, the Ashkenazi, the uh, Ethiopian. Um, you know, it doesn't matter where, you know, it's from uh, the Torah Mashe Jewish leadership. Um, you know, can be found amongst, you know, these particular rabbis throughout the last 100 years or so. In the in previous generations, they are, you know, descend from those previous generations and learn from them. By like token, when you're talking about the diversity of, of uh, Torah Moshe Jews and, or Israelis, um, you're talking about a very diverse group, you know, basically based upon the idea that uh, in the past, Torah Moshe Jews went to different regions and settled in those regions. So if you put everybody back together, essentially what you find is a commonality um, you know, at, at various high levels, you know, amongst the text, the language, and what's considered to be the, the correct text in the language. So we could even look at the text produced by the Samaritans. And the reason why I bring this up is a very important one, especially when it comes to certain claims that are made, um, you know, for those who try to kind of play both sides where they play this Hebrew Israelite side where there are certain people who are not the real thing like them, but at the same time they say, oh, well, we use the same text, but then we can't possibly, and I'll show why. So this text here, for example, if we're getting back into this issue of Devarim uh, 2868, or in um, the Hebrew Israelite language, it would be Deuteronomy 2868, which again, I've said before, is different in their text, at least their original text that didn't come from Jews. Um, within the Samaritan text, you have something that, you know, that's very important. So I mentioned in other like videos concerning this issue of uh, whether or not the people being mentioned in this text would be selling themselves or be sold. So essentially what the the um, Samaritan text says is it backs up what I was mentioning in the previous videos, that the word um, basically, you know, is a word that means that you will sell yourselves, you know, and essentially that later on it says, or in, uh, in their languages, so essentially, again, these are the words that to them, according to the Samaritans, mean that the people being discussed here would sell themselves um, and that nobody would buy them. And essentially what this is, is a situation where in uh, the Samaritan talk, they would say not Hashem, but Shema, um, essentially, you know, was providing a situation where if the people of Israel, of uh, Yisrael, keep the Torah correctly, there would be a situation where, you know, there wouldn't be certain things. And if the Torah was not correct, uh, kept correctly, then there would be other things that would happen in the opposite direction. Um, and essentially, when you go by the Samaritan uh, commentaries on this particular text, it doesn't have anything that equates in any way to the transatlantic, um, uh, you know, importation, sale, and enslavement of West Africans. 
Um, you know, that doesn't come up in, you know, in their commentary at all. So that, of course, would mean that their ideas and concepts about their Torah, which, of course, is written in a different script than the ones used by Hebrew Israelites, uh, doesn't come to the conclusion that they have, which, again, means that they have a, they had originally a different text, you know, and it means that the Samaritans also don't hold by this idea um, that the uh, Hebrew Israelites have. So let's look at something that I consider to be rational in my eyes, but I know that there are some Hebrew Israelites who consider it controversial, and that's dealing with texts produced by Hebrew Israelites. So when we start dealing with this issue, I think it's very important to go through these two comments I got from a particular Hebrew Israelite a, a number of years ago, and I think he still has his own YouTube channel. Um, essentially, what, one of the things he claimed was that this particular stone called, stone called the Los Lunos Stone um, essentially had, uh, you know, it was like it was a Hebrew Israelite text. That was what he was trying to claim, more or less, and that uh, it was written by like a certain group of uh, Native Americans. Which, interestingly enough, I've never seen a Native American from any of these uh, particular groups claim that their ancestors wrote it and that it belongs to them, or claim themselves to be Hebrew Israelites. You know, but again, I don't know. That's something that he, that's between them and the Hebrew Israelites. Now, one of the things that's interesting at the very end of this, at the bottom, this particular Hebrew Israelite or this Moor Israelite mentioned something very interesting. He says, um, how many times have I told you we have the same 20 commandments as you do, whether it's the Torah scroll, Tanakh, the King James Version 1611 Bible, or English translation of the Torah. Now, this right here, to me, points out something very interesting. Because of the fact that in the Torah Moshe Jewish community, a King James Version 1611 Bible is not, being, is not used. We don't consider that text authoritative in any way. Um, English translations, for the most part, are not even authoritative. So obviously, by him saying that they use a King James Version of a 1611 Bible, and by him saying they have 20 commandments, that's obvious. I mean, in the 20 commandments part, it could have been a slip up on his part. It may have just simply been. But the minute he mentions this Los Lunos stone and the King James Version of the Bible, he's immediately saying that this is not Torah Moshe at all, you know, as far as, he, you know, what he's talking about. It's a Hebrew Israelite thing, you know, and that has nothing to do with Torah Moshe Jews because the Los Lunos stone is not authoritative to us in any way. And this is the stone. Now, this is the stone that this person was describing. Now, I've heard of this stone, but even before I heard of this person. And the thing is, is if you take this, and if you, like, let's say you go and learn the type of like, language that's written on this. Now, anyone who can decipher it, because it's very hard to decipher some of the letters, because whoever wrote this was not read, write, writing in a script that you find archaeologically here in the Middle East. Um, when they find, you know, like Paleo-Hebrew writing, it often doesn't look like this. I mean, this is very sloppy in some way. Um, even though the person, whoever wrote it, was trying to like line it up correctly. Um, but what's interesting is that there's spelling mistakes in this, like in a number of different areas, that would mean that if they were not incorrect, you know, misspellings, for example, it means that the person who wrote this, like either was, you know, didn't know what they were talking about because they made some very critical mistakes, or that the Hebrew Israelites have a different language. So again, this person claimed that this is a Hebrew Israelite text from one of their tribes, um, you know, so again, that's up to, between him and them. It's not something that even matters to me because it's not a, a north authoritative text for for Torah Moshe Jews. So now, let's look at some texts that we can 100% identify as being Hebrew Israelite. Now, all of these texts are unacceptable within the Torah Moshe Jewish community, especially since they're written in a uh, type of Paleo Hebrew script. But also, the other thing is the one in the middle calls itself a King James Version of the Bible, and it specifically states that it's a Hebrew Israelite edition of the King James Version Bible. That to me tells me that we're talking about two different things here, because nobody in the Torah Moshe Jewish community would consider any of these texts authoritative at all, and all of these were written by people who 100% identify themselves as Hebrew Israelites. So for example, the one on the right side, which says the Torah in ancient Hebrew, well, the guy who wrote that, I looked him up, Hebrew Israelite people in the middle. It's identified as a Hebrew Israelite King James Version Bible. The one on the left, it's written in a, a form of Paleo-Hebrew. Also, the people there identify themselves as Hebrew Israelite. So when we look at Hebrew Israelite texts, ones produced by Hebrew Israelites, they don't look like Torah Moshe Jewish text. So we can automatically say that they're not the same. And if you look inside these books, they don't tell you that any of them came from a Torah Moshe Jewish community text in, in, you know, in the language that is used by Torah Moshe Jews. And so we could go across the board with this. I mean, for example, the one on the right side here, which calls itself the Holy, which is called the Holy Bible, says it's a King James Version Bible, and it says it's the official Israelite Nation edition. 
Um, the one next to it says it's a Hebrew Elizabeth edition of King James Version with the Apocrypha. Um, then you have the other one to the left, which is like his word, you know, you know Hebrews light scriptures. So again, when Hebrews wise produce their own text, these are the kind of things you see. And these are the kind of things that, you know, or make themselves distant from something that's Torah from Mashiach Jewish, which is perfectly fine. If this is what Hebrews lights say comes from their tradition, that's perfectly fine. But it's not the same thing as what we Torah from Mashiach Jews have. And if someone were to bring this to a Torah from Mashiach Jew and say, hey, this is official to you, we would say, no, we're sorry, but that's not. Maybe for you it is, but for us it's not. It's not something that came from our ancestors. It came from your ancestors. It's not from us. You know, it's not something that our grandfathers, great grandfathers, and great grandmothers, and so on and so on, ever used or knew. This is all your stuff. It has your, you know, your titles all over it. It doesn't belong to us. And it's because of this that I said to myself, okay, well, based upon all the different claims that have been made by Hebrew Israelites um, on the uh, videos I've made, I went back and tried to reconstruct a, a text, you know, of, for example, Deuteronomy 28:68, based upon their responses about it, based upon their descriptions of what it means to them. And what I basically did was put it in Paleo Hebrew and made it very clear in the text itself that it would be talking about people from West Africa, you know, who were taken across a big river and sold into slavery by people who were white, and that they were sold and that somebody did buy them, which essentially is, of course, different than what the Torah from Mashe text says. But, you know, again, this is the only way I could understand, you know, where they could get something like this without there being what's called a Masora or being um, a passed down tradition about how they came to the conclusion that a text that doesn't say certain things all of a sudden does say those things. But again, this part, you know, if you want more details on this, this video here is the one where I did this and at the end described it. Um, and basically, again, I reconstructed this based upon the fact that, A, there is no, you know, I've never personally seen a Hebrew Israelite text from prior to about, like, let's say 500 years ago that supports their claim. B, I went back and said, okay, well, all the different descriptions that Hebrew Israelites, you know, have told me about their history, their claims, you know, it obviously would have to be reflected in their text somewhere in order for anybody to know that that's what it is. Uh, because again, the only other way I would know that they could claim these kind of understandings um, would be if they say that some, you know, like, um, you know, miracle happened for them to all of a sudden get this information and then pass it down, unless they're saying that their grand their parents told them this, their grandparents told them this, and their great grandparents told them, so on and so on. So again, if we're trying to identify, you know, Hebrew Israelites, I mean, look, we can look at this picture and everybody, I think, would say Hebrew Israelites. It's pretty clear that that's what we're talking about here. Um, you know, the the act of standing on a street corner, you know, with a microphone saying certain things, using certain books, somebody reading in this format. This is pretty clear a cultural a Hebrew Israelite, and this is not something you find in Torah from Jewish culture. Okay, so again, I mean, if we look at this, you know, we can tell that this is culturally something completely different than what you find amongst Torah the Moshe Jews. Um, it's not the same, you know, so culturally speaking, you know, we can obviously say that we're not talking about the same groups of people here um, and that uh, the ancestry of both sides would be different, which seems to be something that even Hebrews lights agree on, that they culturally come from a different situation um, than Torah the Moshe Jews, which again, I'm only going by their comments and it only makes sense. Um, because I don't know any other way that somebody would be able to ha address this historically speaking. Now, this part is going to be probably a little controversial to some people, uh, mostly, I guess, to some certain Hebrew Israelites, not to all of them, but to some of them. And this is one of the things I find very interesting, especially with uh, some of them that have tried to criticize what I've said about them having a different uh, text uh, than Torah Meshe Jews. And in reality, what I find is that quite a few of them who try to make this claim that they use the same thing we use, that often what they're describing is that they've actually purchased for themselves Ashkenazi Jewish texts and are using them, when in reality, you're basically using a Torah Moshe Jewish text, and it, you know that was not produced by anyone who was a Hebrew Israelite, which is a big difference than saying that it's like a text that, they came, that came from them, and I'll explain why. So... Not long ago, remember, I think I've done a couple of videos where I was dealing with this whole, uh, um, from the, from the I guess you could say, Hebrews like perspective, the Deuteronomy 2868 issue. And the last video I did was you know, Deuteronomy 2868 versus Devarim, you know, 2868, for example, meaning that the Jewish text is different than the Hebrews like, you know, construction that I did based upon their claims. Now, one of the um, particular like, Hebrews like leaders who did a video about this, he brought up a very interesting point. He, you know, brought up something saying that, hey, look, you know, you know, this guy is wrong, you know, that he's like claiming that we have a different text. We use the same text. There's a stone edition Tanakh 
versus the Aleppo Codex, which she at one point had criticized, but then it was like it was okay, but, you know, back and forth. And essentially what he was saying was like, we use the same text. But one of the things I found interesting when I thought about it, I was like, well, wait a minute. This is like comparing apples to apples. Why is that, do you say? If he's using a stone edition to Nach and he's a Hebrew Israelite, why is he using a Jewish text versus a Jewish text? Meaning, the both of these are Torah Moshe Jewish texts. Why is that? Because the stone edition to Nach was, you know, basically put together by Ashkenazi Jews. Here it is right here. This is the stone edition to Nach. Read through the information and look who edited it. It's edited by Rabbi Nosson um, um, Sherman. And Rabbi um, Nosson Sherman is this man right here, who's an Ashkenazi Jew. Why is a Hebrew Israelite using an Ashkenazi Jewish Tanakh, you know, when he's got a Hebrew Israelite options out there, supposedly, that he would be able to use? That, to me, is something interesting. Now, again, I know that there's probably some explanation that they have, but essentially by saying that, you know, they use the same text, what he's essentially saying is that they use an Ashkenazi text, which is the same as the Aleppo Codex, which to me is what I've been saying for the longest, that Torah Mashe Jews, which Rabbi um, Sherman is a Torah Mashe Jew, the Hebrew Israelite is willing to use his text that he put together and, you know, basically try to compare it to the Aleppo Codex, which is the same thing. And again, one of the things I find interesting about this Hebrew Israelite who tried to do this, that he didn't mention anything about the other text I brought up, like the Leningrad Codex, like the Yemenite code, you know, text of the Torah, like the Samaritan Torah. He didn't bring up any of that other stuff, just the Aleppo Codex. But it's funny enough to me that he was using a stone edition Tanakh, which is an Ashkenazi Jewish Tanakh, and trying to compare it to the Aleppo Codex, which means that he's simply taking a Torah Mashiach Jew text from one region and comparing it to a Torah Mashiach Jew Jewish text from another region, which means that they're basically the same, but it doesn't support his idea that the Hebrew Israelite idea is somehow, you know, somewhere in all this stuff when it, it's a text that has nothing to do with them. So that's where I, I found this kind of interesting. Now, further to this, in the same video, the person um, was trying to make this claim about why uh, Deuteronomy 2868, from their perspective, you know, meets all the standards of it being something about um, uh, the transatlantic, uh, you know, enslavement of Africans. But here's the thing that's funny about it. In order to prove another point later in his video, he used the website called Sephoria. Now, Sephoria, you know, of course, is not a Hebrew Israelite, uh, you know, source of information. It is, you know, if you look here, it says the following about Sephoria. Sephoria is an online open resource, free content, digital library of Jewish text. It was founded in 2011 by former Google project manager, Brett uh, Lachspieser, and journalist author Joshua Foyer. And the CEO is Daniel Septimus. Now, let's take a look at who the one of the founders that are mentioned here, Brett uh, Luxpeser, and I apologize if I'm mispronouncing his name. He's at the top here, and the current CEO is at the bottom. These are, you know, as far as I know, you know, Brett Luxpeser is an Ashkenazi Jew. I'm not sure about uh, Brett Septimus, but you know, he's obviously not a Hebrew Israelite. Neither one of these men are Hebrew Israelites. So it's strange to me that someone who's Hebrew Israelite is trying to make this point and using Jewish text to do it. And, you know, essentially, of course, Jewish texts are the same because they're both Torah Mashe Jewish texts. That's why they're the same. You know, obviously, when you look at a text produced by Hebrew Israelites, they don't come out the same. You know, because, again, we looked at what some Hebrew Israelites produced as their own texts. They don't look the same. And, of course, when they say that they're the King James Version Bible, that's not the same at all either. So one of the things I know that some Hebrew Israelites mention about this whole thing is they say, well, the only correct way for the for their you know I guess their understanding of texts that either are theirs or not theirs to be understood is esoteric. Now the funny thing about the claim of something being esoteric is that it's designed you know basically the meaning itself is designed to be understood by a specific limited uh, you know in, initiated alone group of people. Meaning that you know there's only going to be a small group of people who understand this thing because they were initiated into the understanding. Um, and that this basically small inner circle of people are the ones who get to understand it. But here's the problem that I see with that. You know, again, it could be whatever it is. If that's the definition that is being used by Hebrew Israelites, how exactly did these individuals who, you know, who put out these ideas by Hebrew, you know, Hebrew Israelite leaders, where did they get the information from? Who initiated them into it? And then who initiated the people who initiated them into it? So on and so on. So again, it's like, okay, well, are you saying that during the enslavement of, you know, certain uh, types of um, um, African-Americans, you know, who now claim to be Hebrew Israelites, are you saying that during that whole time that there were people who were passing down this information specifically about Deuteronomy 2868, saying that, hey, everybody, 
if you ever want to know who the real Hebrew Israelites are, it's in this one particular line of this big text here. Just this one line is enough to let you know who's who. You know, nowhere in the text does it say that that's how you identify anybody as being a Hebrew Israelite. And in fact, the statement Hebrew Israelite doesn't even show up in the text at all. You know, so that's where I say that this whole idea of something being esoteric brings up a number of problems. But again, it's, it's one way that some people can kind of wiggle their way out of, uh, you know, certain uh, things where like in the previous video I showed how, you know, there are conclusions that I was mentioning that, you know, come from, you know, Torah Mashe Jews more than 2000 years ago about what the Torah in Hebrew means. Um, you know, and it wasn't just me making something up, for example. Um, and this is the thing that I find interesting. So like, let's say, for example, we want to say, well, what did Hebrew Israelites 600 years ago, you know, if there were such a thing 600 years ago, how did they understand Deuteronomy 2868? Where are their commentaries about the text? Which text did they have? Did they have like the Jewish text, the Samaritan text? Did they have it in Paleo-Hebrew? Where can we look at these texts and analyze this idea? Because other than that, if it's esoteric, then you would have to be able to say, well, this is where I got it from. And then this is where the person who gave it to me, where he got it from, and so on and so on. You, you know, And that's why I say that one of the problems that the Hebrew Israelites have is that there are other African-American groups who say that the history and ancestry of African-Americans is this other thing that's not Hebrew Israelitism. Um, you know, and they should be contending with that rather than contending with me because, again, it's not my place to tell anybody what their background is. And again... This is why I came up with this whole, you know, like reconstruction, because, again, I've never seen any Hebrew Israelite pull out a text of theirs from, like, let's say, 600 years ago to be able to show. Now, I've shown them some of my videos, you know, Torah Mashe Jewish texts from, like, about 1,000 years ago, you know, 500 years ago, you know, and, and 600 years ago and before. Um, you know, I've also, you know, shown that there are Dead Sea Scrolls, and that's one of the things that some Hebrew Israelites claim. They say, well, you know, the Dead Sea Scroll says so. But the thing is, there's no, I've, I've yet to see a Dead Sea Scroll of Deuteronomy 2868. Um, it could be that there's one out there somewhere that hasn't been found yet. Um, but when I looked around in the Dead Sea Scroll archives, I couldn't find anything on that particular one. Um, and not, you know, especially one that supports any of the claims that they made. Um, you know, because again, you'd still have to find someone from like a thousand more years ago who says that, oh yes, this is talking about one day the people will be taken across, you know, by ships, you know, and they're going to lose their entire identity and that only some of them are going to find it. And there's going to be arguments about what the identity is and they're all going to come up with different ideas. And again, I covered this in that previous video that I mentioned. So now I want to do a very interesting thing. I want to do a comparison between Torah Mashe Jewish, Samaritan, and Hebrew Israelite pronunciation. Because I think if we can kind of cover the pronunciation being different, which it is, then we can say, okay, well, obviously they can't both be from the same background if they're speaking, you know, two different languages. And if, if the, you know, the, the way it's used, and the grammar is all different, you know, we can't be talking about the same thing here. Let's go over this video that was made by a guy named Zion Lex. He was the one who did the two videos, I think, about addressing things that I mentioned in some of my videos. Um, now, I want to kind of look. He did a video called Hebrews of Lights for Dummies. Now, one of the things I find interesting about uh, this particular, um, you know, like some of the information in this video, at least the cover part of it, is the statement right about... ...here. This here and this here. Now, this right here 100% solidifies to me that what he is using as a text, uh, as a language, is different than what we Torah Mashe Jews speak and how we use our language. Because I've noticed some things in the way that his um, um, letters are pointed here in terms of whatever vowels he's using, as well as like the order of like the text, the order of the words that he's used here. And I'll explain what I mean by that. Okay, so if we get into the differences in pronunciation, let's start here. This is how the word um, that most people would know um, in by Torah Mashi Jews, we pronounce this word here as Ivraim. Ivraim, sorry. So Ivraim is how we pronounce it, Ivraim. So Ivraim. That's you know how you would pronounce this word. Now the next step over, I would say, okay, well let's look at what you know how Samaritans pronounce it. Now, Samaritans, I think that's closer to them, it would be Ibrem, Ibrem. Now, again, my Samaritan's a little rusty, so Ibrem is, I believe, how they would pronounce this. And you'll notice that in one of the, you'll notice that there's some letters that they have less of, they have less Yuds in their language than, um, than uh, with uh, Torah Mashi Jews. Now, this is what uh, this particular person, Zion Lex, had in his video. So, in his video, he had this here, which would be pronounced Ibrem. Ibrim. Now, 
you'll notice that his pronunciation is different than the Torah Moshe Jew one. The Torah Moshe Jew pronunciation is Ivrim, Ivrim, where his is Ibrim. Now, he's, his is a little bit more similar to the Samaritan, which again, maybe, you know, maybe he's using Samaritan Hebrew, um, but his is different pronunciation-wise than what is used by Torah Moshe Jews. And that difference, you know, also comes up in this area right here. He's got a situation here where he's got a resh with a chirik under it, and then two yuds after it. In Jewish Torah Mashe, Jewish Hebrew, you know, in the language we speak in Ivrit, this wouldn't work. This is not something that would be done in uh, the Torah Mashe Jewish language. So again, in his dialect um, that he speaks, and that is the dialect of Hebrew Israelites, it appears that they have a different element of grammar that's involved there. Now the area here is this particular word here. He has a word there called Yisrael. Now you'll notice under the last letter on the left, the Lamed, there's a Nikuda there called Chirik, but that's because he had Yisraelim. But I want to focus on just the first part, Yisrael, that he has there. So this again would be pronounced Yisrael, for example. Now comparing this to a similar word amongst Torah Mashe Jews, Amongst Torah Mashe Jews, the word you see there that just appeared is Yisroel. Yisroel. So you'll notice that pronunciation-wise, there is an extra um, vowel there that's under a different letter than it is under the one that Zion Lex uh, had in his video. So that would tell me that uh, Torah Mashe Jews and Hebrew Israelites have a different uh, language of pronunciation for this particular word, and the words are even different. Now, the Samaritans, on the other hand, pronounce their word here, Yishrael. Yishroel. So you'll notice that one of the things that's interesting here is in, in this particular Hebrew Israelite writing, they have a letter that's not here that you see in both the Samaritan and the um, the um, Torah Meshe Jewish uh, text, and that's the Aleph. So in the Hebrew Israelite um, version of this word, they have no Aleph there, but in the Torah Meshe as well as um, Samaritan, there's an Aleph there. So that means that the language of Torah Meshe Jews and Samaritans is closer to each other than it is to the Hebrew Israelite language. Now the other part here is that under the Resh here of the uh, Torah Mashiach Jews and Samaritans, there is a, a, a vowel there that doesn't show up in the Hebrew Israelite text uh, that was written by Zion Lex in his video. So that is the Resh within the, um, the Torah Mashiach Jewish version. It's Komotz. And in the, um, the Samaritan version, um, I don't know the name that they use for it, but it's more like a ah sound. So that's where you would see a difference in pronunciation. And that's why I say that this is, you know, we're not talking about the same language here at all. Um, you know, there may be similarities to it, but in something that's produced by Hebrew Israelites, they often, from what I've seen, have a different pronunciation of it, and it appears they have different rules of grammar. So then if we analyze this question of how in both languages, you know, amongst the, um, you know, Torah Moshe Jews, amongst Hebrew Israelites, how do you even say the word Hebrew Israelite? Because again, amongst Torah Meshe Jews, there is no statement Hebrew Israelite uh, in our language that's uh, you know that shows up anywhere. But how would how would you write this you know in the in the languages? So if we look at the Hebrew Israelite language, the way that they would write it is as Zion Lex had it as Ibrim Yisraelim. So again, in the Hebrew Israelite language, it's Ibrim Yisraelim. But when it comes to Torah Meshe Jews, you know if we were to try to say this statement as is, um, essentially what we would come up with is something is like this, of Yisraelim Ivriim. So again, Yisraelim Ivriim. So we can see that there's obviously a difference in pronunciation, and the reason is because of the fact that um, the word Ivriim would have to come after Yisraelim, because it's more like it's, a, it's an adjective, um, you know, describing what type of Yisraelim we're talking about here, the way that it's said in English, you know, because it said Hebrew Israelite, you know, so essentially in, um, in Torah Mashe Hebrew, you would have to put the Ivrim after Yisraelim, where in the Hebrew Israelite language, you would put the Ibrim before Yisraelim. So, you know, again, that's why I say that these differences exist and they obviously can't be the same thing. And further to that, like I mentioned before, that you know this type that nobody talks like this in uh, Torah Mashe Jewish language. There is no such thing as a statement of Yisraelim Ivrim, and there's also no statement of Ibrim Yisraelim amongst Torah Mashe Jews. 
you know, again, we would only, you know, we, I would just simply say most Jews, I know if they hear this kind of statement, they wouldn't really recognize, they wouldn't know what they're t listening to. And at the end of the day, we'd probably just say, you know, we'd be speaking in Hebrew and just say Hebrew is white every time we would say it, just to say whatever they say in the language they originated it in. So in conclusion, as you remember before, I stated that Hebrew Israelites have their own distinct titles, text, concepts, languages, needs, actions, claims, nationalities, etc. Now again, I know that there's going to be some Hebrew Israelite out there somewhere who's going to say, no, we use the same text you use, but we covered that already, that whenever they said that, they're always talking about a text that was produced by Torah Mashe Jews, not something that Hebrew Israelites produced on their own, or came from a transmission of Hebrew Israelites from prior to 500 years ago or so. You know, this is something that I find is very interesting about this claim, um, of using the same information when it's like, no, you just got that from some Torah Mashiach Jews. And usually they get it from Ashkenazi Jews, which they claim Ashkenazi Jews are not Jews, which again, for me, it's like extremely confusing, but it doesn't, I don't have to understand it. You know I mean? I, I'm separated from the issue. I don't really have to understand it. This is something that I would say that Hebrew Israelites have to iron out amongst themselves. Um, you know, so this video again was done just to kind of cover these issues, because like, again, I noticed that there was a video that was made in response to my previous two, and this will probably be the last time I ever mention this again, because again, it, it just doesn't make any sense to me, and it doesn't have to, um, you know, and again, I only talk about this because I'm, I'm open to any kind of uh, criticism, I'm open to any kind of uh, information that someone may have, and again, I have like a group of questions that I've kind of reserved for anyone who tries to say that Hebrews lights and, you know, Torah Mashiach Jews have the same stuff. I asked a couple of them this, these group of questions once, I think it's like about 15 questions, and I said, well, Clea, well, how do you guys do A, B, C, and D? And in every single situation, people were like, well, I don't know what you're talking about, or I have to ask someone and they never get back to me. And I'm not willing to say it here because, again, if someone brings up this whole idea we're doing the same thing, it's like, okay, well, we're not really because you keep saying things that contradict what we go by, which is fine. You know, nobody's telling you not to claim what you're claiming. Um, but then you seem to kind of have this idea that if someone doesn't agree with you, there's something wrong with them. Um, and I, you know, I, I'm one of those people at the moment, I can't really listen to too many Hebrews light videos, especially some of the ones that um, have like a lot of sound, sound effects on them. Because um, my thing is just like, let, let me just have the information quick, easy, and be done with it. You know, this video I'm hoping to not be under 40 minutes and not be something that's like very long. Um, so again, in order to close this up, you know, I think this is the last time I'll ever talk about this topic, but I just felt I needed to do this one more time. So this is Ahab Ever from the Chronicles of Ahab Ever. And I thank you for listening. Take care. Bye.